not hear me? Oh, um, I, you're, you were a little muffled there. Kind of low. Um, actually, no, I'm not going to talk about the treasure map. I, I've, I deferred so glad that. glad we have conversations during the week. I'm going to stop doing that. What's that? You got to. I well, said, I'm so glad we have our conversations during the week because I post the schedule and what we're going to talk about and it never happens. So everybody can just be equally surprised as I am from now on. <laughs> well, it's, it's not that it never happens. It's just that uh, something else came up. Okay. And so I figured that uh, being how that's what happened, that I should go ahead and play into this thing of what came up. Okay, so Lisa had a question about Yom, which is uh, Yod, Vav, Mem, and she's asking why the O sound is a is a y sorry is a Vav instead of a instead of an Ayin or an Aleph even. Well, I I noticed a word. I was looking at Zephaniah two, verse four. Just if you want to look at it, it mentions something about Gaza. So Gaza is where the Philistines lived, right? We still even have it called the Gaza Strip, Ashkelon, and a couple other cities there. The way that they spell Gaza in Hebrew is Ayan Zion A. And we've talked about before that Ayan Zion is where they get the word for Oz, like the Wizard of Oz that the ion is the equivalent of the letter O in the alphabetic sequence. So we have uh, H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O-P. Well, there's no psalmic in English equivalents, but it's uh, M-N-M-N-U-N, ion pay. And there's no Zadi either. So those two letters, the psalmic and the Zadi, have been excused from the English lineup. But the thing about the letter ion is that it's pronounced as the letter G or kind of a the word het is you you get that scratchy sound towards the front of your mouth. The letter is a ion is this softer guttural towards the back of your throat. That's the way I've heard it explained. So the hyan haza. I, how do you put the, a letter? G-H, maybe? The pronunciation. So I had mentioned before about Jethro, Moshe's father-in-law, was also referred to as Raul, or Rahwell, 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 which might have become Rockwell in English. But what I'm saying is this letter I-N has a number of ways to pronounce it. You'll see that sometimes it's pronounced as an A, an E, an O, maybe even this U, but it's actually this very back guttural GH, soft, not hard like a hat, but oh. And the letter cough is actually not pronounced like a K like we do, but kind of also a, uh, like the word samic, we might say S-A-M-E-K, samic, but it's more like samech. Well, you'd think that if it was Samech, it would be a, a, a het at the end, but it's not. It's a cough. So what I'm saying is that the the way that Hebrew is pronounced today, you have those three letters, the het, the cough, and the hyan, in a progressive guttural, you might say, if you call it that. The het is the harshest. The cough is a little bit softer, and the gyan is very soft. So... To say, well, why is it not pronounced as an O? So why is Yom written Yod Vav? It has more to do with what the letter means rather than the way it's pronounced. And then that's a matter of saying, well, what, you know, Vav is a nail. So Yod Mem is water. So what's water in a nail? What's that have to do with anything? I'm just saying that the study of the language is all you're pondering, you're contemplating. It seems like an excuse to get some. Uh, discussion going, and and you could say, well, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, he, why should we get a discussion going on how to spell the words? Well, it seems like that's what Yahoo built into the language is for us to have the very conversation about why is the word spelled that way. 
and that there's a great advantage or benefit to us to do that. Um, but anyway, did you want to open the things up with a uh, word of prayer here? Maybe Kurt and we can. Yeah, just Lisa, does that help? Hi. Hi, shalom, everybody. Hey, I have Sally. a suggestion. Hi. You know, or perhaps if, it, if we take a look at that very question that Lisa has, Eric, and, and I mean, so where is the placement of the uh, of the um, mem in the noon? They're inside the cut. And so that, you know, being inside the cut from the establishment of the vav being inserted into in between the mem and the noon to create the word yom for daytime year kind of thing where it's a, like an appointed time that takes place in the cut. We're learning the uh, ways of Yahweh and his appointed time, his days, Shabbat. That's one aspect of maybe, you know, taking a look at what the uh, effect the Vav has being placed in between y Mem and Noon to enhance that word. Well, it's actually point. between Yod and Mem. But what did I say? Right. Mem, oh, Yod. Yeah, it's between. Y yeah, it is. Okay. But by his hand, it all happens. So that's one way of looking at it. There you <laughs> go. Even it's, the yod is inside the chet. So. Yes. And Sally, since you spoke up, can you open up this in prayer, please? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yes. Oh, thank hallelujah. You. Yahuwah. Thank you so much for our beautiful Baruch Shabbat that you've provided. It's been wonderful. Thank you for gathering every one of us today on this day to get together and listen to the discussion, the study of your word. Thank you for planting your seeds in our hearts, writing your words on our hearts, and being fruitful and prosperous with your word and your seed. Thank you for blessing Eric with your Ruach HaKadosh and each and every one of us as we listen and Shema. Hallelujah, Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And we'll get going on something I have no idea what we're talking about. So <laughs> it's all you, Eric. Everybody shut off your camera and microphone. We'll see you in a minute. So there's this fellow by the name of Kerry Alexander in uh, Oklahoma. He's a musician. I stopped by his place last year, year before. He had, has written a number of interesting songs. Anyway, this one album opens up and then ends with a rephrasing of this song that the lyrics are based on some verses in Revelation chapter five. And the lyrics go, who is worthy to open the scroll? No man in heaven or in earth below. Do not weep for behold, there is one, the crucified son. And I've heard, I've listened to this album a number of times, you know, driving in my truck, I'll put on some music to keep my attention alert. And I've heard this song a number of times, and I know it's from that vision that John had in the book of Revelation. And the Reve book of Revelation starts off in the first three chapters with this vision of the, it, well, he's being told about seven assemblies or a message that's given to a messenger, an angel, regarding seven assemblies. And then it breaks into this other view of up in heaven. He heard a voice and he was caught up into what look, looks like or appears to be the throne room. Not that it's a room, but there's a throne. And, and so this business in uh, the beginning of Revelation 5 is that there's this one who's sitting on the throne and he's holding a scroll in his hand. It's written on the inside and the outside. And it's got, it's been sealed. Well, what does that look like? So imagine that scenario. He's already just had the opening of Revelation, where there's a message to seven churches. That's what we're told. Seven churches. 
We're also before that in the beginning of Revelation told that he sees this vision of what looks like it's Yeshua who's standing amidst the candlesticks. Well, what does that mean? Is there seven candlesticks? Is there one menorah with seven, as it were, candlestick branches? Because the word candlestick or chandelier or lamp post is all just the word menorah. It's the place that light emanates from. So you have mem, nun, vav, resh, hey. So hey is the suffix which is expressing or shining out. Vav resh is the word for pronounced or, not I and resh, but vav resh, or which would be light. Nun vav resh, nor, well, nun is this engaging letter that's uh, energized. So it's, you might say, pushing the or through the hey. And the mem prefix is the place, right. the place where light is pushed out from or the sourced from. So the word menorah, we think of as that three curved branches that make six arms and then one straight one down the middle, because that was the shape in Exodus uh, 25 and following chapters where Moshe was told how to design the Mishkan. So that's where the menorah shape comes from. But technically, any source of light, a flashlight, is technically a menorah. So. Here is, uh, let's, let's just say it's Yeshua standing in the midst or next to, or standing with, beside. What does it mean to be in the midst of candlesticks? If you were gonna shoot a music video, it seems to me Sting of the police, he, he did a, a, it seems to me I have this vague memory of a, of a dark environment and a whole bunch of lights and he's walking amidst these candle sticks. Is that the picture of the beginning of Revelation? Or is Yeshua standing next to one candlestick? And why the number seven? Why is he giving us a list of seven churches? And then if you go to read into Revelation, it talks about a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. And then there's seven spirits of Elohim. Why this number seven? Well, as we talked before, people are told the perfect number seven, the seven's the holy number. Why? Well, I think the answer, and I say I think because I've not heard any authoritative source that says, behold, this is the answer of why seven is so significant and why it's used all the time when regarding the heavenlies. Why is there seven days of the week? Why is there seven Moedim festivals? It's because the meaning of the number seven, which in Hebrew is Shin Bet Ayan, that exact same word that is the number seven also means to swear a vow, to take an oath. And it also means to fulfill the vow. So it means satisfied, surfeited, filled to the full. In other words, you swear a vow and you do what you say you're going to do. But it also means the curse that comes upon you if you fail to fulfill the vow. So in Leviticus 26, where Yahweh says, if you consider my words, my ways, my instructions to be abhorrent, reprehensible, loathsome, despicable, or you treat them with a casual disregard, like whatever, those attitudes will be repaid or revisited seven, and then is it seven ways? Is it seven times? Is it a time, well, that, that's where you get seven times the 390 day curse in Ezekiel 4. Seven times 390 is 2730. But why seven? Because the word seven means you fulfill a vow or you get the curse. Well, is, is the curse necessarily seven times? 
do you have to fulfill the vow seven times? If the word fulfill the vow means satisfy, make it full. Okay, well, what does that got to do with seven? Or is that the concept represented by seven? What I'm saying is that if we start to look at the book of Revelation or anything else we've been looking at, like even in Nehemiah 8 verse 7, where we're talking about the names of the people that were teaching, explaining what Ezra was reading in the Torah, you can read every name as if it means something. So if it was in English and he said, this is George, Bob, John, Sam, Frank, well, what do those words mean? Well, they're people's names. Well, in Hebrew, they're not just people's names. In English, names mean things also. But in Hebrew, the, the name very specifically is, you know, Yeshua. That's salvation. Benny, well, that's my son. Yemen, that's right hand. Benny Yemen, Benjamin is son of my right hand. The, every, everything means something. But if we look at this, thing in Revelation, like the song Carrie Alexander was singing, who's worthy to open the scroll? Well, no one. Well, here, this lamb, this crucified son, he's worthy. What scroll? Well, the scroll in the hand of the guy sitting on the throne. Okay, so I have in my mind a picture of a guy sitting on a chair some human type of looking individual sitting on a chair holding a scroll in his hand and it's got a seal or in, actually seven seals and nobody's allowed to open it why well nobody's worthy what does it mean to be worthy what qualifies somebody to be worthy to then open the scroll. Why doesn't the guy sitting in the chair open the scroll? No, somebody else has to do it. <laughs> What's that even supposed to mean? But at least I have a picture. There's a lamb, for some reason, standing in, next to the throne. There's a guy sitting on a chair holding a scroll, and everybody else is really upset that, that nobody is worthy to open this scroll or undo the seals on the scroll. And then somebody says, wait, there is one. The crucified son. Okay. But it didn't say he was standing next to the throne. He said he was in the midst of the throne. <laughs> How do you stand in the midst of the throne? In the middle of the throne? Is it the throne room? It doesn't say that. It just says, okay, so what I'm saying is the same way that you could look at the number seven and say, what's going on with that word? That word is used, the number seven, or the count of seven things, seven eyes, seven thor uh, horns, seven days, seven whatevers, is because it means it's all about a sworn vow. So when we've been looking at things in Isaiah and things in Deuteronomy, we realized that Yahuwah swore a vow. It's called a covenant. Brit. Bet Resh Yod Tov. He swore a covenant with Abraham. Kept it going through Isaac and Jacob. It could have detoured and went through Ishmael or detoured and went through Esau, but he kept it on a certain path. Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. And then through Moshe. And then through David, these are the principal people that you might say reactivated or brought to mind the terms of the covenant and Yeshua. Okay, these are like road markers along the path through history that have brought this thing back to regard. But it's always the same thing. It's, it's the Brit, it's the sworn vow. And so in Leviticus 26, where Yahuwah says, if you don't seven my seven, if you don't fulfill the terms of the vow, you're going to get sevened, cursed, seven times. <laughs> Seven's a big deal to him because it's all about the agreement. So when he made a vow, 
to prosper Abraham and Abraham's lineage, then that's everything. That's, that's the whole driving force behind human history played out for the next 7,000 years. So when you look at seven pieces of the Mishkan, it correlates. Seven churches or assemblies in the first three chapters of Revelation, it correlates. Seventy sevens, or is it seven sevens in Daniel, was it 924 to 27? So if we're going to try to look at what these things mean, if we look at the meaning of the Hebrew word, we'll see a different picture. So if I'm picturing a throne, somebody sitting on it, holding a scroll, it's sealed, and there's a lamb, he's got seven eyes, he's got seven horns, he's been killed, and he's worthy. What does that mean, worthy to open the scroll? So if I look at just those English words, I would think there's something suitable, perhaps, some regard of this lamb that makes him more fit, more appropriate to be the only one or someone, if there's anyone, who could open those seals. Well, why couldn't somebody else go open the seals? Well, they're not allowed. The guy holding his hand says, get back. Or is he that he can't? There's no way he could physically sit there and peel the thing apart or cut through the seal somehow and get this scroll open. What's this vision trying to tell us? Well, so as I was listening to this song on the radio or on the, the CD, I was thinking, well, what's the word for lamb? What is the word in Hebrew for worthy, for seal, for throne, for open? And all of a sudden, it turned into this really interesting study, I think. So if you weren't looking at Hebrew words and the various synonyms, meaning other Hebrew words that mean the same thing, you'll never get this. If you don't think that there's any merit or value in kicking around why is there a vav in the middle between yod and mem for the word day? And then why is the word days spelled yod mem yod mem, which is the same as the word for seas, like oceans, seven seas? Why are there seven seas on the face of the earth? What are they? You have to have a mind to start pondering thinking, investigating, inquiring, searching, and then you realize as you look through the dictionary, how many times you bump into those words that mean those things. Search, ponder, meditate, investigate, look into, it's, it's all over. David was doing it actually quite a bit, and he was uh, commended for it. Abraham, what was his experience? Abraham was, as well as David, was called the friend of Yah, friend of Yahuwah. Moshe was uh, pretty much the only one. It says he saw him face to face, but then he doesn't have a, Elohim doesn't have a face. So, and we're told, I believe it's in the New Testament somewhere, that no one has ever seen the Almighty. So how could Moshe behold the Almighty face to face? Or is it metaphorically face to face? If he doesn't have a face, then what does that mean? What I'm saying is that the pictures that we get in English is not necessarily the same picture you get if you look at the Hebrew words. So there happens to be, if I looked in Strong's Concordance, see the nice thing about Strong's is that you can just say, what's the word lamb? And you look that up and it'll give you a list of all these different numbers. Then you go to the back of the concordance and you look up the numbers and it'll tell you the Hebrew. So it says that there's four different words for lamb. And then in looking at Klein's dictionary, I found actually another word 
that means lamb. Why wasn't it in Strong's? So now you have this thing, does, is Strong's totally comprehensive, meaning covering every use? Maybe, but perhaps there's words used in Hebrew that Klein's dictionary will tell you that's a word that can mean that, but it's not necessarily used in scripture anywhere. So you'll get a different sort of perspective if you look at Strong's than if you look at Klein's. And the reason why I promote, you might say, the use of Klein's is because I found it to be really that it does a great job. There's a guy named Ruben Alkalay that had a dictionary, five volume set. Two volumes were look up the English word and it'll tell you the Hebrew. And the other three is you look up the Hebrew word and it'll tell you the English meaning. And there's I've looked at other dictionaries too, but for some reason, the format layout of Klein's I find to be really, really useful. Then there's um, Englishman's Concordance of the Old Testament, I believe is what this is called by Wigram. And if you're looking at a certain Hebrew word, like if you want to say the word uh, Nun Shin Lamed, one of the words sitting here, you, you look that up and it'll tell you all the places in the scripture where that word is found. It's kind of like Strong's Concordance. You look, you look at the word lamb in Strong's and it'll tell you all the places where the word lamb was translated in King James. It might not be translated that way in an, another translation, but none of them, you, you can't count on any of them to be 100%. You've got to put a lot of your own effort towards this. So is there only four different words that are translated as lamb, or is there five, or is there more? It almost doesn't matter. It's just a study. And then you'd have to say, well, which one of these words was used in Revelation 5? I believe it's verse 2. Or that's where it starts saying who's worthy to open the scroll. And to loosen its seals. So there's two things it says. If, if I just said, well... Who's worthy to open the scroll? The words worthy, open, scroll. But it also says that to loosen its seals. Loosen its seals. Why not break the seal? Why not cut open the seal? What do you mean loosen? Loosen. Why? Well, was the book of Revelation written originally in Greek? Was it Aramaic? What are we dealing with? We, we don't even know. See, we have inherited from this day... 90 AD approximately when Revelation was written, 2,000 years of clutter, of distortions. If you go back to the days of David, it's pushing 3,000 years. And David really was reading through the scripture and seeing some stuff, but then whatever he was seeing, whatever he was doing with the scripture, it had gotten so lost that in the days of both Josiah and Hezekiah, they were rooting around digging digging through the rubble in the temple that was being used as a storehouse or a market or whatever. And they say, hey, what's this? And there's a scroll and they open it up and they've never seen such a thing. In fact, we were reading in the book of Nehemiah that they were reading from the scroll. It was Yom Teruah, the first day of the seventh month. And it says they had never kept the regard of that day. And then because a couple of weeks later it was Sukkot, since the days of Joshua. Well, that means David, who was a good 400 years after Joshua, never kept Sukkot, never kept Yom Teruah. David didn't. He was listening to Yahweh. He was talking to Yahuwah. Why didn't Yahuwah ever tell him, hey, you should do this? But then if you, if you read the book of Joshua, so when Moshe died, Joshua, who had been his right-hand man, took over the leadership, more of a warlord, he brought in the people, crossed the Jordan River, took out Jericho, and then there was this whole campaign for the rest of his life on taking over the promised land militarily. But the first thing they did before they hit Jericho was keep Pesach, Passover. And it said that they hadn't done that. In fact, they had to stop first and circumcise all the males. It's like, no, wait a minute. They'd been just wandering around in the desert for 40 years. 
with a pillar of fire, pillar of smoke going before them, showing them where to camp. Yahuwah's presence in this pillar of fire, pillar of smoke above the Mishkan for 40 years. He, one of the instructions for Pesach was only if your males are circumcised, are they allowed in the house to keep that meal? You can't just have a Passover celebration willy nilly with anybody coming in to have a party. That's not what it's about. Is that still the case now? And I've over the years, the last 20 years or so, I've had that this conversation or, or heard this conversation amongst all of us who are trying to regard Yahoo's ways. Some people will advertise on the radio saying, hey, we're having a Passover Seder and everybody's invited and you can just come see what them Jews do in their own secret cloistered places. Should that be an offense to Jewish people to have the Goyim, the Gentiles, pretend to do Jewish stuff and dress up and try to copy their rituals, only do it with, with great sacrilege, rather than a sacred regard of what Yahweh said. And this is where we find ourselves in these days. Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Do we think we're supposed to be doing something which we're not? Why is, should the Jews be offended, or are they, or are they happy to see a bunch of infidels messing everything up and not taking off their shoes and tracking in mud all over the nice clean carpet, as it were, profaning the rituals, the ceremonies. What's going on? What are we about? Just a minute, I'm being called to attention. What's, what's up? I can't, I can't hear a word you're saying. Right, I, she's just bringing up the, uh, it's Karen, she's, she's just saying, the scriptures say no man is to be uncircumcised who's at the uh, Pesach Seder. So the, the point that I'm making is that for Joshua to hold a an event, as soon as they cross the Jordan River to say, let's make sure that all the males are circumcised, it's like, wait a minute, that means that even though Yahuwah was in their presence, pillar of fire, pillar of smoke, for 40 years wandering through the wilderness, they never kept Pesach. If we're supposed to be doing this as an annual event, why then, for the 40 years following the original event, with Yahoo's presence to be so dramatically manifest, did you not have him do it? And then if they did it with Joshua, kept Passover, and then they go in, circle Jericho and the walls fall down and all. Did they abandon the practice? Did David pick up the practice? And then when people later, hundreds of years later, start reading the Torah and they go, oh, we should be doing this stuff. Well, then it was abandoned again for nearly 2,000 years. And here we are today, present tense, Pesach is upon us. A week out for some people. Some people, I think, did it a couple of weeks ago. Other people are going to be two weeks from now, and other people, or maybe three, and other people uh, a month from now. But I'm just saying, this is the zone of Pesach. Do we even need to do this? Should we? But why didn't he ever stir it to the attention of people before us? And if we're going to do it, how should we do it? What's the big deal? Are we trying to prove ourselves to be worthy? Worthy as the lamb was considered worthy? Worthy of what? Worthy of being called his people. Worthy of hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. That's really the only thing that matters. Well, as I was looking through these various words, one of the meanings of the word worthy, so I'm gonna address these different words here. But one of the meanings of what, well, here, let me just say this. Worthy is the lamb having been slain. Six different words from Strong's Concordance that mean worthy. One of them is kuf tet nun, Q-T-N. Well, Q-T 
cutie. In English, it's C-U-T-I-E, but Kuf Tet, where we, we get our letter Q in English, literally is like this small little thing, which could be seen as no big deal. It's just this cute little thing or something that's an abbreviation. So Ya is the Kuf Tet, abbreviated short form of yod heh vav hey. yod heh compared to yod heh vav hey. Bob as compared to Robert. Bill as compared to William. It's, it's just an abbreviated. MTN instead of M-O-U-N-T-A-I-N, for example. So you have no big deal in abbreviation. What does that got to do with the meaning of the word worthy? But in Strong's Concordance, Kuf Tet Nun might be translated as the word worthy in the English. Also, Bet Nun. Well, wait a minute. Bet Nun is the word for son, S O N, a child of a father, an expressed image, a genetic, passing down genetic inheritance. How is that the word worthy? But if you look in the dictionary, it'll say one who is worthy of is the son. That doesn't mean the word son means to be worthy, does it? Thinking, pondering, trying to wrap your mind around why did the professional translators and all the really smart guys who put together Strong's Concordance come to the conclusion that if you see the word spelled bet noon in Hebrew, maybe it's translated worthy, not just son. But yet bet noon hey is the word to construct, as in doing building construction, and bet yod noon means understanding. But what have those got to do with worthy? I'm just trying to show you that this is the nature of what we're dealing with. We talked last week about, and previously, as saying, boy, this is kind of dangerous job translating and then trusting your eternal salvation on whether or not you're accurate. And then when you start looking at King James and saying, well, at least we know that, that King James is infallible and inerrant, so I can trust my eternal salvation on King James. And then you hear various stories that, no, the guy was rather corrupt, and the people that he hired to do the translating work were not necessarily so virtuous either, nor accurate necessarily. And it's like, well, no, wait a minute. We were told that the KJV, King James Version, is absolutely the world standard gold class absolutely the best translation that's ever been done. Refined seven times, as I heard one guy say, and it's like, oh, they know it's not. So what's anybody going to be judged for whether they believe the right stuff? So we could say, well, at least we're not going to be judged for what we believe. We're going to be judged that we believe. And we're going to be judged if we've asked Jesus into our heart to save us from our sins, only I said last week, that's not written a single place anywhere in the Bible. The closest place in the Bible where it says that we should ask Jesus into our heart is in the book of Revelation. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes where Jesus says he stands at the door and knocks. And if any man will open up and invite him in, then he will come in and dine, dine, eat with that man. He didn't say he'll save his soul. He didn't say he'll forgive him of his sins. He said, I will eat. And that's been turned into, if you want to get saved, you better ask Jesus into your heart. Otherwise, you're going to burn in hell. What are the rules of this life anyway? How can any of us make any sense, whether we have the right translation, whether we know what the words mean, whether we have the right pictural imagery, whether we even know what we're supposed to to do if we've been lied to and even the best translation is a distortion a fabrication possibly falsehood and it by its own words the translators are saying this is the only the best because they're admitting that all the other ones are fake also or at least don't meet with their 
official approval, then what do we have? So if we have the wrong calendar, are we going to burn in hell? I heard it said a couple of years ago that why the calendar matters is because Yeshua said he's going to come like a thief in the night. Take us by surprise. And if you're not ready because you'd have the wrong calendar, you're going to be like the five bridesmaids who fell asleep and didn't have enough oil. And so they were taken by surprise and the bridegroom came and went in with the five that were ready because they had the right calendar. And if you're one of those five who have the wrong calendar so that you're not ready, he comes on a day that you didn't expect, then you're doomed to go through the tribulation or burn in hell like I never knew you. You see, this is why they say, if you try to make sense of the scripture, it'll drive you insane. Don't even go there. Go to church, sit in the pew, listen to the priest, listen to the clerics, the clergy, the ones who know how to read, the ones who are gifted from on high to, to be an open channel, a flow, a conduit of information so that we can rest, rest and trust them. And this whole problem of doing this study is that you realize they're untrustworthy. Maybe they mean well, but they're still untrustworthy. And then when you start reading in the scripture and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zechariah, you'll see that even Yahuwah himself is disgusted with the priests, the Levites, the ministers, the pastors and teachers that are supposed to be teaching his stuff, but aren't. They're doing it for their own aggrandizement, you might say, their own benefit. I heard one person say that he was going to seminary, and one week they said, okay, we're now going to teach you how to fleece the flock. And the guy quit. He said, that's it. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna deal with this. Well, everybody else, that, that's part of the job. It's like learning how to collect payment if you're doing a job. Okay, if you're a, if you're a minister tending the flock, then you have to learn how to fleece the flock and you get the benefit of the wool. That's just part of the job description. It's not necessarily evil. What I'm saying is that the more you look at what's going on in this world. It's pretty difficult. And what I've determined for myself is that looking at the meanings of the Hebrew words is kind of like the clearest, purest, truest of anything we got. So that's that's what this is. That's what this is doing. So if I'm saying, well, what does it mean to be worthy? One of the words for worthy besides kuf tet nun and bet nun is aleph pei. But Aleph Pei is the word for wrath, nose, anger, but it's also character. Yod Aleph Pei, characterized. We talked about the Nariz del Santo, the nose of the saint. We talked about that last week. What's that got to be worthy? Do the very good job sculpting the nose of the saint or painting the nose on the Mona Lisa and everything else is excusable, but the nose has to be perfect. The nose have to be worthy. Does that mean that the word Aleph Pei means worthy or that the condition of the nose determines its worthiness? See, what I'm trying to show you is that this is the way the Hebrew language works on your mind. It's not just the sun, the, the cute thing, the nose. It's, it's how it fits into what you're seeing. Another word is het lamed. Well, if you look at het lamed, it means secular or common or profane. Well, if something's secular or common profane, it's not worthy. How can it mean worthy? So the only way to then determine what does het lamed really mean is to look at all the derivatives. Het lamed in the dictionary means army or force. <laughs> and secular and profane. If, is it a military term or does it mean vulgarity, which it also means that? Chet hey, weak, sick, but also pleasant, like 
challah bread, challah bread. Aleph hat lamet, stick a prefix letter. It means to wish for. Het yod lamet, recruit, enlist, join the colors. To join the colors is a term to join the military. University of Oregon is emerald green and yellow. Oregon State Uni College University here is uh, black and orange. So if you're a fan of the ducks versus the beavers, these two almost, ac almost across from the same city, kind of like UCLA and USC, the colors that you bear, like hoorah for our side. Yeah, and then you have the, what they call the civil war, the, the colors against colors. So Yahoo's colors, blue, purple, red, and white. It's like sport those colors. It's like, hey, sign up, join up, be on his team and his re enlisted, recruited to be his zavot, his people. Surrounding the Ket Yud Lamed also means, besides join the colors, recruit, enlist, military, surrounding wall. How's it a surrounding wall? That's like the wall around Jericho itself is a Het Yod Lamed, like a fortress, like a castle, like a Het. It also means wait or hope. See, what I'm saying is if you start looking through the dictionary, your mind is going to whirl and start flipping around, writhing. It also, that's what it means to whirl, dance, or writhe like you're giving birth. A woman in labor is Het Yod Lamed. To move in a circle like a surrounding wall. Strong, successful, writhing anguish, military, created, performed, birthed, brought forth in labor. In one place, it's even used to mean listen and repeat. How can all that be het yod lamed? And it's used to mean worthy. Het vav lamed means it happened. Also, move in a circle, world dance is where we get the word hula, because it also means sand, and is the phoenix bird. So we call the phoenix a phoenix, but in Hebrew it's called hul or hula. Remember the phoenix, it dies, it, gets, it is burned in fire, and then it resurrects from the ashes and is reborn. What does that got to do with anything? And what about dancing in a circle in the sand to tell a story, doing the hula? Hawaiian term, het lamed lamed. You take the second letter, het lamed, and duplicate it, making it the third. You get het lamed lamed. You get profane or common. Well, that's not set apart. It means redeemed, useful, hollow, pierced. So if something is hollow and pierced, well, that describes the look of a flute, a reed instrument that's hollow that holes in it. That's het lamed lamed. But it also means pierced, wounded, and slain. That's like Yeshua being crucified. It means to begin to play the flute. A priest who's denied the priesthood or a priest of illegitimate descent. Well, that's like Yeshua again. He was denied the priesthood. This guy's an infidel. He's a he's a crook. He's a scumbag. Let's let's kill him. Let's punch holes in him and drain him out. So to drain him out. All that het lamed or het lamed lamed. So what I'm saying is that you you read this word, you go through all these meanings in the dictionary, and, and your mind says, hey, I'm making an association with other Bible stories I know. Halal, well, that's the eighth letter, the English letter H. Lamed, Lamed is L. Well, oh, that's like the word hell. Hell. But it doesn't mean hell. That's Sheol or Hades or Gehenna. So... This study is making all these connections for your own self, navigating the language. But it's considered the word worthy. Another is the word ish, Aleph Yod Sheen, but that's just the word man. And if you look in the dictionary, it also means personally. It's the pupil of the eye called the little man. It's a private matter personal. But ish can also use, be used to mean hero, masculine. That's like the word Gabor, Gimel Bet Vavresh. Also, anyone. 
It can also refer to matrimony. So if a woman says something about my man, it's the one she's married to, it's possessing this, this one. It also can be used to simply mean individuality. So if you see the word ish anywhere in scripture, it can mean any man, it can mean my personal man. The idea that it means worthy, again, is outside even what the dictionary gives us, but Strong's gives us. And then one that they didn't have, which I would put in here thinking, well, in my thinking, this is the word worthy, is Dalit Yod, which means sufficient or enough. I see we're getting close to an hour's time here. So let me, let me, uh, let me, let me summarize the word worthy. If you take instead of any one of those words and say which word was used to describe the condition of the lamb in the throne in the midst of the throne in revelation 5 let's look at all of the words an abbreviation of the expressed image of the father the character like the nose military, personal, and sufficient. That's describing Yeshua compared to our Abba Yahweh, as we might call him. And I say that because if you look a little closer, even though he says in one place, his name is Yahuwah, yod heh vav -Hey, I'm a father to Israel, never really says that Yahweh is the father's name. If you look real close, that's a matter of debate. But the point is, he, who shall I say sent me? Ehiyah. Tell him Ehiyah sent you. Ehiyah, Asher, Ehiyah. Oh, but Yahweh will be my Shem Zakar. That's masculine remembrance. It's not necessarily the father's personal name. What I'm saying is that the closer you start getting, looking at this Hebrew stuff, you'll realize everything we thought we knew, we don't know. That we have misconceptions. But if I take these six different words that might be used to plug into the English word worthy, no big deal. It's an abbreviation of, as a son, the expressed image of, perfectly representing the character and nature of military, which is to say strong, successful, though writhing anguish to be brought forth in a Laborious, birthing, creating, performing man, pupil of the eye, personal, sufficient, successfully, that, that's good. That describes who Yeshua is in comparison to his father. Our, what he said was our father and his father, our Elohim and his Elohim that we call, we call Yahuwah Zavot, the Elohim of Israel. That's who Yeshua is compared to him. And for, the only way I can see that is if I'm taking the definitions of six different words, none of which are pronounced worthy but together collectively, they described what it means to be worthy, the condition of the lamb. And we're at the break here. So I'm going to, when we come back from the break, I'm going to do the same thing with the word loosen, the same thing with the word seal, the same thing with the word scroll. And we'll get a picture that the lamb standing in the midst of the throne, who's worthy to open the scroll is actually really, really, uh, I, I think, surprising and interesting and pertinent to exactly what we're doing by looking at these words.